everybody, my name is Hope. I am the program director here at Camp Recruiter and I am so excited to introduce all of you to Scott Crane. Hi Scott. Hello Hope. Scott was our chaplain last year for our 4th of July family camp. He came with his two of his daughters and it was so fun to have Scott there. And if we were having camp this year, Scott would have been our chaplain at our July youth camps. So that would have been mini camp, elementary two, middle school two, and senior high. So we're really missing having you here for that this year, Scott. Thanks. Uh, we live in northeast Portland, and we're in that Multnomah County um, area where we just are supposed to stay sheltering at home. So we jumped into that uh, COVID-19 distant learning at school stuff. So I've got two elementary school students, my oldest and my middle child, and then my youngest, who was with me at camp, is a pre-K student. So we've had an interesting several weeks here. I bet a, a virtual learning with, with the littles, I imagine, is uh, has a, a special challenge that maybe you don't have quite as much with the, some of the older kids. Very true. Very true. Uh, well, they're, they're, I'm sure that they're appreciative of all that your family is doing to support them with that. So I'm sure lots of our, our campers and listeners feel your pain. <laughs> So I have one get to know you question uh, for you, Scott. Are you ready? I'm ready. This? Okay. Okay. So if you could have a song play every time that you enter a room, what song would you choose? So this is like your walkout song for life. <laughs> That's a tough question because being a bit of a musician myself, I have lots of lovely songs that go through my head. But the one that's been playing the most for me recently in my head is one out of the Glory to God hymn book called Praise, I will praise you, Lord. Praise, I will praise you, Lord. Awesome. Nice. So every time you walked into a room, you would just start playing. I hope you won't get tired of it because this is your forever uh, walkout song now. Yes, it's got three verses. The first one is praise, I will praise you, Lord. The second one is love, I will love you, Lord. And the third verse is serve, I will serve you, Lord. I like it. I like it. And I have heard Scott sing many songs, and he is really great at bringing musical elements into camp. So... That's one thing that we're missing this July, among other many great things that we are unfortunately missing this year. Um, Scott, will you tell us a little bit about what your favorite camp memory from 2019 was? Sure. I had my youngest two children with me there when we did family camp, and we went wave jumping. And I had never, ever done that in all the many, many years that I'd been to Magruder. And so it was really cool to experience it new with my two children, the youngest children, who had never done it either. That's awesome. How many years have you been coming to Camp Magruder? Uh, my first year at Camp Magruder would have been the summer of 1999, probably. No, that was when I was at Subtle Lake as their program director. 2000. Yeah, 2000. Very cool. Well, Scott, can I invite you to open us with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray together. For the morning light and its irresistible dawning, for your untamable utterances of life in boundless stretches of space and the strength of the waves of the sea i give you thanks O oh god release in us the power of your spirit that our souls may be free that our spirits be strong release in us the freedom of your spirit that we may be bridled by nothing but love that we may be bridled by nothing but love amen amen all right well everyone i am going to tell us a little bit about the curriculum that we use in the summer so in the summer we get a, a curriculum for camp that has in it verses and themes and this year the the curriculum offers us a scripture passage and a phrase from a different culture that captures what each scripture is trying to help us think about and we get a pretty fun one today, I thought. We have the word agape. So agape is a type of love. You might be familiar with, with several different types of love, but agape is the one that is used by early Christians to convey uh, some of the special qualities about Christian love. Um, I have always thought of as 
of agape as unconditional love. It's love that motivates, regulates, and characterizes all human conduct. And it's what all of the commandments are summed up by in this commandment to love. So God is defined as love. God is defined as love. And God's love is unmerited acceptance of all people expressed through Jesus. So this is a love that reconciles and makes peace with all of us. It's unconcerned, unconcerned with itself and concerned with the greatest good of another. Do you have anything that you would add to that, that definition of agape? I would actually. One of the Tell neat me. things about that Greek word is an uh, implied part that is self-emptying. Hmm. And hmm. I can't help but think, since we're being uh, on our little podcast here this day after Trinity Sunday, that some of the writings that have come out recently from the mystical stream about the Trinity being a three-way self-emptying love. And to me, that just is agape to the fullest. Agape love is unconcerned with the self mm -hmm. and concerned with the greatest good of another. Since we're made in the image of God, our Trinitarian tendency as we're made is to self-empty our love into others, mm -hmm. while at the same time they're self-emptying love into us. Awesome. I love it. Well, I'm so excited to explore this theme with you and our scripture for, for today. Are you ready to hear the scripture? Read it, yes. Great. Okay, so this comes from John, John 13, 1 through 17. And this is a story you might be familiar with. It's when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Hear the word. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to be with his father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clo clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher, Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, and teacher have washed your feet, you should go and wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master and no messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's kind of a long one, but it's a great story. You want to tell us a little bit about it? This story only appears in the Gospel of John, which is the latest gospel. It was written after the other three. And one of the neat things about this particular gospel that I really resonate with personally is its connection to the Celtic spiritual stream, which is mm -hmm. uh, where the prayer that I said came from earlier. Um, but it, what they have in there, what they call the Celtic memory, is that John, whether true or not, uh, they see John as the one who had been leaning against Jesus at this meal when his feet were washed and all the disciples' feet were washed, who heard the heartbeat of God as he leaned against Jesus. And wow, in that Celtic, I've never heard that before. Yeah, oh, cool. in that Celtic memory, that has struck um, through the entire John 9 community, which has kept this sense of that close intimateness with Jesus alive through all kinds of persecution. Mm. And so this whole setting of being the servant that Jesus is for all of them is passed down in their memory and is becoming so important as a symbol and as a reality for how to do this self-emptying love for one another. Mm -hmm. 
and that just strengthens their community in an amazing way. What, what do you think this story is all about? What's, what's going on here? What's the feet washing really about? That's a really good question, and different commentators have had different thoughts about that. What I really think it's saying at the heart is reflecting back on the whole agape love. Jesus is giving this physical, real example to the community of which he has been a part and has loved with all of his ability for so long. And he is saying, this is what you are going to do when I'm gone. You will give your love and your life to others. It doesn't matter what status games people play, whether you're part of the Roman Empire, or if we want to move that to applications today, whatever race you are. It doesn't matter. Totally. The new consciousness is experienced. The master-servant relationship is different. And it all has to be embraced within divine love. So the whole point of being able to empty ourselves for another is how Jesus is enacting this foot washing. And of course, Peter's, oh no, don't do it to me, I can't stand that. <laughs> well, Peter, this is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. What do you think, Hope? Well, this, I've always been told that this story is all about lowering, maybe maybe lowering yourself is not the right word, but the... I think that as I hear it now, I hear a lot about like the humility to love and to accept love. And I think of this, so maybe some people have seen this, The Perks of Being a Wallflower was a book and movie I used to love. And the, the big phrase in that movie that's like the takeaway is, we accept the love that we think we deserve. And I think that, that it's reminding me a bit of that right now. That's just coming up for me and thinking of what we, this, to me, it more than ever, it says something about loving ourselves, but also being um, so like for Simon Peter to, to know that he's got to accept the love that he's trying to give. That's kind of what I'm hearing right now. I've never noticed that before. So that's totally new. Just coming to you straight off the top of the dome. That's good. <laughs> Each of us comes to scripture with our own contextual uh, life history. And that could be different for many of us. I imagine this posture that Jesus physically does, getting down on his knees, the humility that you spoke about, to wash these feet who have been walking through dust and have been dirty and probably have all kinds of nasty stuff in it. And here is the Lord down on his knees, emptying himself to show this utter posture of servanthood to those whom he loves the most. Mm -hmm. And as I think about that, I'm reminded actually of another uh, spiritual stream. The Hopi have a proverb that all are supposed to be like the water, seeking the lowest level. Mm -hmm. And that's their definition of humility. And this posture of kneeling and serving and washing is Jesus and how we as followers of Jesus should also be. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I just keep hearing us think and talk about the way agape love seems to be really linked to humility. And I think that goes straight back to that emptying of the self that we're kind of talking about there. I think so. I love it. I love that. So I have another question for you. Um, what do you make of the line that says, unless I wash you, you have no part of me? So Jesus says that to Simon Peter after Simon Peter tries to refuse to have his feet washed. What a, what does he mean that like, if if Peter wouldn't let him wash his feet, could he really not be a part of like the things that he's doing? That's a really good question, and I think that part of the answer to that can be reflected in what's going on with current events today. Cool. Tell me more. We might be able to say things and speak things and believe the scriptures totally. Here's the word. Here's how it affects us. But then we look out at the world and are we actually doing things in the world that reflect the same kind of agape love? Mm -hmm. Have we been able to be in solidarity with those around us? When Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me, that's basically saying, sure, um, you can preach the word, Peter, but are you going to get down on your hands and knees and wash the feet of your neighbor? Are you really going to get down 
in the humility that's needed to be a self-emptying agape love follower. Yeah. Oh, yes, maybe I should, says Peter. But at first he's like, no, I don't want to get down and do that. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> after the second <laughs> saying, oh, yes, maybe wash all of me, please. <laughs> I mean, it is sometimes hard to understand Jesus. I'll get, I'll get here with Peter, you know. Sometimes you have to figure out what Jesus is really talking about. I think I have a lot of things to <laughs> I identify with Peter. I'm skeptic at first, but I want to be there with you. <laughs> All right, so this week we are going to do the sacred practice of sacred imagination, which is brought to us by St. Ignatius of Lo- Saint Ignatius Loyola. We did this for the first time um, with Jade Rasbin in our first episode of the Camp Magruder podcast. Um, so um, in, in this practice, what you do is you're going to imagine yourself into the story. St. Ignatius um, created all of these Uh, spiritual practices around imagining himself into the stories and um, and just being really intimate with what's there with the text so imagining the tastes the sights the sounds the smells and the settings and how that um, changes the way that you engage with the text that's kind of what uh, sacred imagination is all about and what we hope for you to engage with us this week so uh, yeah Scott would you read the scripture for us one more time It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you. You're welcome. So from here, the questions that we ask ourselves are, what stood out to us in this reading? And so... I'll offer the invitation to both of us to talk a little bit about what stood out to us as we imagined ourselves in this room. And I have a thought, if, uh, if you don't mind me starting. I was struck in hearing at this time I w- of just being a body, you know, being a smelly, dirty body and how embarrassing that can be if you don't feel prepared to offer that in some sort of presentable way. And I was imagining, like, looking around the room and, like, you know, seeing that Jesus is coming down the line, like, comparing my feet to, like, 
a few people around me and being like, oh, well, my feet are not as smelly as Judas's, so uh, I guess that's all right. So I don't, I don't know that there's anything important to take from that, but I could just feel some, like, really human feelings and emotions of, like, having to to know that, like, part of what I think that what Jesus is kind of doing here is, like, you know, you're going to offer this to other people, and probably probably Jesus didn't think that much about the smelly feet. It probably was, I mean, it feels like his reason for doing it is greater than that, and I can imagine feeling that way myself, but having to put yourself in the shoes of the person who is receiving the love or having their feet washed and knowing the... I think there's something wrapped up in dignity about that. Just, like, really changes your perspective of serving, too. I don't know if that's coherent. (laughs) I really like what you said in that last part. It changes your perspective about serving. Mm -hmm. And when I think of how that passage strikes me, I kind of think of it as how a painter would look at it. So Mm -hmm. for me, if I were in that scripture somewhere, I think I would be on the far side of the table from Judas Iscariot. And I would have probably just been looking up at him when Jesus said, but not all of you. And I would have seen him take a sort of a movement back into shadow. And I would have wondered right then, oh, what does that mean? But this is someone who's been with us all along, who's really a part of our group, who, and there goes Jesus around the end of the table, even washes his feet too. And I would be struck all over again with how big, how deep, how wide this love is, and maybe even how unworthy I am to receive. Yeah, I can imagine that, like, once Jesus was gone and once you, you know, the disciples put together that it was Judas, like, looking back at that moment and, like, remembering that Jesus didn't skip washing anyone's feet. That's right. He didn't. He washes everyone's feet. No matter what happens and who they are, And what a message for us today. If we were to take that place of Jesus and kneel before anyone in front of us, no matter what color, what race, what gender, what persuasion, and wash their feet, is that not agape love? I'm in. (laughs) Preach it, sister. (laughs) I love that. I love that. You know, I have a question for you. Hit me. If we're to try to teach this to the campers, wherever they are with their families and wherever they're sheltering at this point in time, what would that be like for them? How would they be Jesus to their families? Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. How, so how do I offer agape to my family or the people near me right now? Yeah, especially if you're a camper, a young camper, and you've got grown-ups that are worried about all kinds of things in the world right now. How do you serve and love when you might be afraid yourself. I have an idea. Maybe I can go first this time. Yeah, please do. In the households where I'm most familiar, including my own, I've got lots of energy going on. And I have lots of angst going on. We need to be able to share something about who we are with our family members. How can I do that? If I were a camper, I think I would say, Mommy, Daddy, can I help you today do the dishes? Mommy, Daddy, can I help you today clean up the rug? Maybe I should put away my toys without asking. All kinds of little things that, as a grown-up, I might trip over in the living room and go, why isn't this put away? (laughs) And then I have to take a step back and go, wait, what's more loving? How do I teach things to my children? What would they say if they could just enact on their own? How can I help my family today and show them love? Mm -hmm. Love it. So can you repeat your question for our campers one more time so that they can uh, think about it with their family? Yeah. How could you be able to show love to everyone else in your household? How can you be the foot washer? What's in your power? All kinds of things. As a camper, you, you can be Jesus to your family. Right. The last thing that we're going to do together today is something that we uh, often do at camp at the end of each day, 
called Highs and Lows. So uh, that's how we'll end today. And and one of the reasons that we share highs and lows in community with one another is that we can offer each other um, this sort of agape love when we know each other well, whenever we're able to see the human in the person that we're connecting with. So this helps to grow our empathy and also to help us to just know each other um, in our quest to offer agape love. So I'm going to invite us to start off with sharing our lows for the day. Okay. I have a low. I'll start us off. I am in. So the, the work that we do right now at camp is strange, uncharted territories. And it is Monday for Scott and I when we're recording this. And I just came in with some anxiousness. Came into work feeling really anxious about what the week would hold and what, uh, what I need to do to make sure that camp is going well. So my low is just like a little little pit of anxiousness that's been in my stomach all day yeah well i have a low and as you've heard throughout our little conversation i've got three children here in the house with me and my wife and (laughs) we've been trying to paint the youngest room and uh we've been trying to get them to embrace online learning and it's very very difficult so my low is uh, struggling with my children to embrace this online learning and to have to figure out how to get around the tantrums that happen on the floor about not wanting to do it. I don't like to write. I don't want to do this. (laughs) Math is stupid. (laughs) Or whatever it might be. And so every every week, the last several weeks that that's happened has been a low. And again, it happened on Monday today as we're trying to finish our last week of school. You can do it. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> Hold on, you can do it. The frustrations of online learning. I think that is a low for everyone out there. This goes out to you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's end it on our high note. What what's a what are our highs for today? Ooh. Ooh. I've got a couple of those. Okay, you go first. I have to say that you're asking me to look into this agape was really really cool. And in my own angst before this little conversation, I didn't know how prepared I'd be. But my high is that I think the Holy Spirit was here. And I think was talking with us and helping us through this conversation about something really deep in the scriptures that we can learn and, and, and do and be in our own lives, whether we're campers, or whether we're staff, or whether we're parents. That's right. And that we will never fully know, but we can always learn more about. So... I'm, I'm really appreciative of this conversation, too. Awesome. Thank you, God. Thank you. My high today, um, we, let's see, at lunch today, um, I, so Troy and Allison Taylor are, Troy is our director here, Allison is his wife, they have a daughter named Ara, and their family has so kindly really let me be another family member during this time of, uh, of COVID-19. I live out here alone away from my family in Tennessee so they have kindly welcomed me into their house and today at lunch I walked into the dining hall with a bit of that anxiousness in the pit of my stomach and Ara who is three ran across the dining hall and gave me a really big hug and it made all that go away for a little while so shout out to my friend Ara my hi today is my lunchtime hug awesome that's great awesome Well, Scott, I really appreciate you being here today. It was a lot of fun, and I hope that all of our listeners will have a great day and think a little bit more about agape love and how you can find it in your own life. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.